I'd like for us all to welcome Josh Davies. He is the CEO for the Center of Work Ethic Development out of lovely Denver, Colorado, where NCSL is based, and we are happy to have him here in Boston. <laughs> Uh, Josh is actually a published author and contributor on the topic of work ethic and leadership to a number of national publications, and today he will share with us the seven secrets to legendary leadership. Please welcome him. Awesome. <laughs> Stacy's choosing to take the no step approach down there. Um, thank you all for coming. The after lunch slot is awesome. So uh, if, uh, if I lose some of you, I'm gonna do my best not to embarrass you on live stream by coming over and talking to you, okay? So I'm not saying that I will, but I'm not saying that I won't. Uh, in my day job, when I'm not talking about leadership, I run an organization called the Center for Work Ethic Development. We partner with more than 650 organizations in 47 states who are doing workforce development and job training, whether or not that's in secondary ed, post-secondary ed, through traditional government workforce, nonprofits, community-based organizations, ex-offenders, uh, veterans groups all over the country. Uh, quick shout out, my Kansas folks. Woo! Uh, we partner with the Kansas Board of Regents. Our curriculum is in every community college in the state of Kansas. West Virginia folks, I saw one of you. Maybe she left the room already. Um, we partner with them and their adult education community to help make sure that adults who are getting both literacy and GED also have the job skills they need to get jobs. But we partner with probably every, somebody in almost every state for you uh, here. So I want to start off by just saying thank you uh, for the support that you give to help develop the workforce in your communities. Today, however, I want to talk about developing you and what you can do. And we're going to talk a lot about leadership in this element. So what I want you to do, uh, take a look quickly around your table. Uh, some folks there. And here's what I'm going to do. We're going to do an exercise to get started this afternoon. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to need to have some leaders for each table. So here's what I ask you to do. Can you all take one finger, point it to the sky. And what we're going to do on the count of three, I want you to point to the person at your table who you think should be the table leader for our opening exercise, okay? This is gonna be especially, hey, I did not say three yet over there, do not jump the gun. All right, here we go. On the count of three, one, two, three, point to the person at your table who should be table leader. Yeah, I think you find out, you find out really quickly who your true friends are, right? So, um, a lot of you were pointing at different things. I thought the most entertaining point off was at the table with two people. <laughs> a virtual tie in Kansas. There's nothing we can do about that. I'm sorry, all right? We'll get new friends, and now you can have a point off. Um, so, I hate to tell you this, uh, but I, I did just lie to you, okay? I don't really need a table leader for this exercise, okay? <laughs> the only cheering is that people had all the fingers pointed at them. They're like, yes. But here's my question to you. How many of you chose the opportunity to point the finger at yourself? I'm looking around a room of elected officials, of high-ranking staff, of leaders in your community, and not one of you took this opportunity to point to yourself to be the leader. Hmm. Now, I'm sure there's lots of reasons for that, right? Um, you know, maybe there's somebody else at your table you wanted to pick on. You're sick of this crap. Um, I, have to, I have to be a leader all the time, and oh, I'm not going to do it today. I do this dude looks crazy. I'm not doing one of these stupid exercises first time. Right? We come up with excuses all the time. But what I will tell you is this, regardless of where you are in your life, Leadership is something that we have to embrace because like it or not, we are all leaders in our community. We're leaders in our states, we're leaders in this country, and we owe it to ourselves, our constituents, and to our communities overall to continue our development as leaders. So today, what I want to spend some time on this afternoon is helping you embrace that, probably not in some ways you didn't know before, but in maybe some ways you help to be reminded of or see in different ways. My goals here this afternoon are pretty simple. All right, I want to talk a little bit about why leadership is critically important now. We're going to talk about our shared understanding that we have with each other. And then finally, I want to help share with you the seven secrets to becoming a legendary leader. Now, I'm going to tell you about secret number one. 
They're not really secrets, probably, okay? You probably have heard some of these before. But my job is to help bring a little bit different context in a way that maybe you haven't seen before. So let's get started talking a little bit about leadership and why leadership is so important. Because in case you haven't noticed, leadership is more important now than ever because someone has joined us and she is not going away. Her name is Change. And Change, unfortunately, is running faster than she has ever run before. Change is happening quickly, overnight. In fact, you may not believe this, but 30 years of time happens so fast. 30 years of time, we can put in one photo. Boom. <laughs> That's 30 years of change. Anybody in this room have one of those old brick phones? Some of you, yes. My brick phone people, right? It was awesome because it was both a phone and a fashion accessory, right? You had to have like the bag with it. Yeah, yeah pretty nice, right? Uh, uh, what's funny, right? Everyone's like, oh, 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 oh brick phones. Anyway, people love them because they were the first device. Let me just take you back in time. Let's go over the specs of the brick phone in case you didn't notice, okay? It took 10 hours to charge your phone. That was a full charge to get you a whopping 30 minutes of talk time. And it still cost almost $4,000. Holy crap. All right, but don't worry, we evolved and the phones got better and smaller and cheaper and faster. Um, Anybody here still have a flip phone? Not that they are willing to admit in public. A sheepish hand goes up, right? <laughs> Do you remember, though, when you got your first flip phone? Right? I remember when I got my first flip phone. I was in DC at the time. And I was like, I'd go out to the bars, and I'd have friends call me just so I could open my phone up. And I'd be like, oh! I didn't press a button. I just answered the phone, right? <laughs> now, when someone calls you on your flip phone, what do your friends say, right? Oh, who's calling? 1997? Do they want their phone back? Right? Yeah. But here's what's funny. When you look at the flip phone, there are a lot of parts about the flip phone that actually kick some serious butt. Right? Think about this. When you get your flip phone, it has got 75 hours of battery life. I'm not going to point anyone out, in particular people who sat on the side of the room because you were next to an outlet, but there are several people <laughs> who have charged their phone, brought their own batteries, right? Because you can't go more than four hours with their smartphones without recharging them, right? And maybe you're like me, if you didn't see my case with my broke, I, like I got this super fancy case and I dropped my phone from my pocket and the screen still cracked. Come on. Have you tried to break a flip phone? <laughs> They're like the cockroaches of mobile phones, right? There will be a nuclear war, there will be nothing but cockroaches dialing each other up on their flip phones, right? And talk about cheap. You can get a flip phone now with prepaid minutes at Walmart for 20 bucks. Think about that next time you sign a five-year deal to get your iPhone, right? Here's the reality about change. We always have to remember, change makes some things better, right? How many of you now would go back to your flip phone because it has all these characteristics? Just the people who are still holdouts. Thank you, sir, all right? The rest of us, you're like, I'm not going back. Right, what we need to remember is change is always constant. It's moving around, it makes some things awesome, but it also gets rid of some things we really love. Change has this mix and this match. What great leaders do is they embrace that change and they ride the waves to get the positives rather than dwelling on the negatives. It's like, uh, well, let me tell you a story. Uh, this story is about a, a young boy growing up in Lincoln, Nebraska. That's me. At 16, my parents didn't have enough money to give me a car. But they got me something that was even more valuable. They got me my very own blockbuster video cards. Because at 16, you could rent your own movies, right? right. Um, some of you are around nodding your head. Some of you I see in the back are like, blockbuster? You're like the dog? What's that? Okay. So for those of you who have forgotten, blockbuster was a magical place. Okay? It was a physical store you would walk in get a video cassette, and walk out. Now, there were some problems with Blockbuster's model, okay? Number one, there's a finite number of movies you had, right? So on busy, like Fridays or Saturdays, you either had to get there early, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon to get the, like, the new movie, or you did what we did on Saturday afternoons, where you would ride your bike to the Blockbuster and hang out and wait by the return slot and wait for the new movies to come into the return slot. Sad, that's what we did, OK? You learned important lessons at Blockbuster, though, right? Like, be kind, rewind, right? <laughs> These are important things, right? Now, in 2004, Blockbuster had 
an amazing number, right? 60,000 employees, 8,000 physical bricks and mortar locations, six billion, that's with a B, six billion dollars in revenue. That's in 2004. What happens after 2004? Anything else change the scene at all? Netflix, Netflix right? What happens with Netflix? When, can, do you have to wait for the latest movie to come out? No. They'll send it to you. Do you have to go to the store? No. Do you have to pay late fees? No, you return it whenever. <laughs> and then they started letting you stream movies. Right? This is absolutely unbelievable. This was amazing. So what was Blockbuster's response to Netflix? <laughs> they decided that people wanted a more authentic movie experience in their stores, so they started selling more candy. They put popcorn machines in and tried to entice people with this extra value add when they physically came to the store. In fact, the director of digital brand strategy in August of 2010 said this, we're a strategically better position than almost anybody out there. Never in my wildest dreams why I've aimed this high. <laughs> that is August of 2010. What happens in November of 2010? We'll do this in a little graphic presentation. <coughs> From $6 billion in revenue in 2004 to bankruptcy at the end of 2010. Blockbuster had an amazing thing going. It had good leaders but they refused to adapt to change. They had a great thing and they wanted to hold that as long as they could. They thought that people would always want to come to these 8,000 bricks and mortar locations. Those of you in Alaska know where the last blockbuster is. In Wasilla, holding out hope, right? <laughs> Movies aren't coming back. Movies that you buy in a store aren't coming back because people didn't want the experience of going to the store, they wanted the experience of the movie. The easier you can get that, the better. And again, not to be a doom and gloom prognosticator, um, but if you look at what's happening in the markets, the movie theater is probably next. Uh, AMC stock dropped yesterday at 23%. The likelihood that we will continue to see movies in the same way we used to is almost entirely going to change. People want entertainment when they want it, where they want it. You have to adapt. Blockbuster, their leaders, chose a different approach. <laughs> and the ostrich approach to leadership doesn't get you far. So if you want to continue to hone your leadership skills, if you want to continue to not stick your head in the sand, you have to figure out ways to keep growing. So for me, when I want to learn something new, where do I go? to the Google, right? I mean, where else would you go? So I typed in leadership into the Google, and if you don't, if you want to do this, so it's hilarious. I now have 501 million hits. I don't have that kind of time, okay? I do not have that kind of time. Fortunately, uh, Mrs. Miller, my third grade teacher, reminded me that leaders are readers. So I went to Amazon instead, right? Because you just can search leadership books in Amazon. So I searched leadership books in Amazon, and I got 214,000 hits. Here's a scary part about leadership books in Amazon. It is the fastest growing category of any other product. In fact, if you look at it, each hour of every single day, almost four new leadership books are added. While we are sitting here, four new books will come out. And I'm going to tell you probably they all stink, right? Because when you look at most leadership books that are coming out, they're not really about anything other than pretending to be somebody you're not, right? Maybe you want to be like Abraham Lincoln. Just grow a goatee, put the hat on, you'll be fine. You'll be just like Lincoln, right? Or maybe you're not intimidating enough to your colleagues. Throw this bad boy on your desk and see how they react, right? <laughs> but the biggest challenge, right, is that oftentimes these leadership books gloss over reality and instead try and highlight on this Pollyanna story about how great people are without realizing that what makes people great is a combination of their strengths and flaws. And when you ignore your flaws, you end up looking at someone through a very distorted lens. Right? Who wants the leadership secrets now of Lance Armstrong? 
Leadership, we always need to remember, it's not about being someone else. It's about being the best us we can be. It's cliched, it's funny, but it is so true. When you are authentic to yourself, you produce leadership results. So how do we get there? How do we become better leaders? Well, it starts with both first understanding more about what we mean by the term leadership. So let's think, of, actually, let me show you a video that I think helps illustrate some of the problems that we run into when we're talking about leadership. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät, das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are thinking, we're thinking. What are you thinking about? <laughs> Look, English is a tough language, all right? There's a lot of confusing parts to it. Um, if you're not a native speaker, and I know some of your room are not native speakers, it's really a hard language. But fortunately for us native speakers, we know we never run into confusion. So let's do this. I need everyone to grab a piece of paper for me. If you want this to be the magic white piece of paper you all got when you came in, you can do that. But we'll need to save most of that for a later exercise. But what I want you to do is I want you to write down four words for me. Or if you're one of those super techie people who are on your iPads, your laptops, you can type them in. This is fine, OK? But here are the four words I want you to write down for me. Word number one. Write down the word definitely. And yes, just so you know, I, I worked out with Tim. We will have a PDF of the handout on the website. So you don't have to worry about that. OK, so the word definitely is our first word. Our second word, probably. Our third word, possibly. And our fourth word, maybe. So you should have these four words, definitely, probably, possibly, and maybe. And what I'm going to ask you to do with each one of those four words is to write down a percentage next to the word. And I want you to write down the percentage of time that you think that someone else, not you, but that someone else will complete a task if they use that word when they tell you. For instance, I will definitely have that to you by Friday versus I will probably have that to you by Friday, versus I will possibly have that to you by Friday, versus I may be getting that to you by Friday. Okay? So you're going to write down the total percentage of time. It does not have to add up to 100. Each one can be from 0 to 100 on its own. Also, for those of you who have a significant other, please remove them from the equation. They will probably throw the whole thing off. Okay? So just other people in general outside of your significant other. Okay? So take just a bit of time. Uh, they can do it on that or on anything. We'll do it. We'll do the selfie later, Tim. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. No pressure, but you have about another five seconds. Okay. We cannot do a committee hearing on this. All right. We're just going to get some answers. Uh, all right. So here's what I would like you to do at your table with the other people, or in a cluster of random people around the wall near you, OK? Whatever that works. What I want you to do is I want you to share your answers with each other and see how much commonality you have and how much difference you have. Now, this is not a time for you to tell everyone that your answers are right and you're so much smarter than they are. We are just looking to see if the answers are in common or not, all right? Take just a bit of time, and we'll do that. And I'll let you know when we're ready to come back should know better than to get this group talking, right? I mean, you know, you're setting yourself up for trouble, right? Yeah, <laughs> and another thing, all right. So as I was wandering around the room, I saw some things that were very similar and some that were, let's just say, a little off, all right? So let's do this. We're going to do a very informal voting, because we don't have a fancy voting system here. But what I do want to do is just a show of hands. So if your score for definitely, let's focus on definitely just for now. If your score for definitely is at 95% or higher, raise your hand. Look around at all the people at 95% or higher. Oops. Oh, I don't know what's happening right now. All right. 
Keep your hands up if it's 98% or higher. Keep your hands up if it's 100% or higher. Hey, I'm just telling you, I've worked on state budgets before. It can go higher than 100. <laughs> All right, so talk to me a little bit about 100 here. What, you're 100% confident? Yeah, yeah. Your word is everything, right? Did I just say I was going to do it? No, I said I was definitely going to do it. I put that extra emphasis in, right? It's an integrity issue if you say you're not going to do it. Some of you, however, are not on the 100% bandwagon. Okay? If you had a score of 80% or lower, raise your hand. <laughs> Keep your hand up if it's 70, 60, 50, 40. All right, let's just stop here. What was the score you had? 20, 10, 20, 10. Really? I said I was definitely going to do this for you, too. What's the story here? Why don't you believe me? A lot of things happen, right, between saying definitely and Friday, right? A lot of things happen, right? Why, why so low? <laughs> I, you're already covering your tracks, right? You're not just like, oh, it's going to happen. You're like, oh, it's definitely going to happen. You're like, really? OK, so here's what's funny. You're in a group of like-minded individuals, relatively speaking. And they were all trying to do the same. But, but we use this word, and we have some of you who are like, your word is your bond. It's an integrity issue. I know you're going to do it. I'm not worried. And some of you are like, dream on. i got the backup plan to the backup plan to the backup plan, right? <laughs> we can do the same thing for definitely, probably, possibly, and maybe. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to find the same range, right? Because one word has a difference between 100% probability and 10% probability. And I'm, some of you in there probably has like a 5%. You were just afraid to raise your hands, OK? Here's my question. How often do we use these four words every day? <clears throat> Pretty frequently. And we think that the other person has the same shared understanding of those words that we do. The reality couldn't be further from the truth. What we have to do is make sure that we have 100% shared understanding of the words that we use. We can't assume that even common words like these four have the same meaning for everyone that we work with. And that's not even counting when you find out later in life that things have been lied to you about the whole time. Two weeks ago, I found out a very damning truth. A strawberry, technically, is not a berry. Because it has its seeds on the outside, it is simply the product of a flowering plant. Think about that one for a while, OK? Surely there has to be some sort of way you can get a waiver for a fruit that has berry in its name to be called a berry, right? But no, that's not the case. All right. So when we talk about a shared definition for leadership then, I don't want to just say be better leaders, be legendary. Like, let's define what we mean by leadership. For me, I like to think that leadership um, is this definition, because this is for me where we really are. And for those of you who are standing in the back, there's a few chairs around front and around the side here. If you do want to come and sit down, you're welcome to do that. If you want to sit on the stage, you can. It's a pad view, but you can do that, OK? If you want to come and get a seat. So for me, the definition of leadership to me is really critical because it involves a variety of things. Number one is the journey that each person takes to better provide vision and inspiration to others. I'm going to start with that first word of journey because I think that is critically important. Um, you know, this session was advertised as, you know, one of the target groups was sort of, you know, young leaders. And it's great for people who are coming up. But one of the things that you have to remember is that leadership is not a destination. Leadership is not a place that you get to after time. Oh, when I get elected. Oh, and finally I'm in chairmanship. Oh, finally when I'm in party leadership, right? It doesn't matter. Degrees, this. It is not something you earn. It's a step that you take. Um, anybody here in the room a uh, crazy runner like me? 
I think a few of you are admitting you are crazy runners, right? So those of you who aren't runners, you know you have a crazy runner friend, and we are crazy, okay? Here's how you know we're crazy. The shortest race most that runners do is a 5K. A 5K is how far? Just a little over three miles. That's the shortest race, right? And it just gets longer from there. The granddaddy of them all, everyone lovers, labors to become a marathoner. A marathon, of course, is 26.2 miles long. Average runner takes about four hours straight to finish a marathon. This is our badge of honor, right? I am proud to say that I finished the Boston Marathon here. Yeah. Don't worry, I got a waiver to get in. I could not qualify. Don't, don't tell anybody. But the reality is this race is an amazing one. It's something we all labor for. Quick history lesson again as a reminder. Um, battle of Marathon is what the marathon's named for in ancient Greece, where following the battle, the guy ran back to Athens to tell them what happened, and then after he told them, he promptly died. That's right. So we run a race as our big crowning achievement that the first person who did it died. Yeah, that's, that's pretty smart, okay? Um, however, in Colorado, where I live now, marathons aren't good enough for us. That's why we have ultra marathons. This past weekend was the running of the Leadville 100. Okay, so the Leadville 100 is probably the most famous ultramarathon in Colorado. Um, it starts in the town of Leadville, which is about 12,000 feet above sea level. That's the lowest point you get. You then go up and over two mountain passes over a fine gravel trail. And of course, it's called the Leadville 100 because it is 100 miles long. Seriously, who does this? Right, that's just insane. Why would anyone do that to themselves? Well, I will tell you this, that is the same thing most people say when they look at leaders. Why would you do this to yourself? You're crazy. Don't you know how dangerous this is? You're stupid for wanting to do that. And you're like, yes, yes I am, all right? And just like running in the Leadville 100, there's times you're gonna be going uphill, you know this, right? It's raining in your face, constituents are screaming at you, you're like, why am I doing this? And there are other times when stuff is rocking and you're coming downhill and you get the breeze in your face and you feel like you could run forever. Leadership is about the crazy journey we've all taken together. It's not about finishing the finish line because Lord knows, when you're running the Leadville 100, you may not. It's about the ups and the downs and it's about the journey. It's the journey to better provide this vision. Now we talk about vision all the time. Oh, you have to have this vision, you have to have this, this. Um, you know, whether or not that's in leadership, whether or not those are campaign consultants, whoever it is talking about this idea of spreading vision. But the most important part isn't that you have a vision. It's that you're able to inspire people to follow you on that vision. As it's often said, no one will believe the vision if they don't trust the visionary. Your job to become a legendary leader is to make sure you do things every day in your journey to build that trust and to get people inspired to follow your vision. And that's what the rest of our time is going to be talking about. Seven steps, seven secrets that you can take to become more legendary in your journey every single day. So uh, real quickly, I know many of you are jotting down notes which I will tell you as an instructor myself, will increase your retention somewhere between 10 and 40%, so keep it up, okay? Um, some of you are taking pictures of slides, that's awesome. If you want, um, when we get done, if you just wanna leave your card um, or an email address, I will send you the link to the Prezi. Feel free to steal shamelessly. Um, it's here for all of you to help in your leadership journeys, okay? So just know that. But if you wanna keep taking notes, please do, because it will help your retention, okay? Um, Let's get into leadership secret number one. And this is, I think, a really important one. Uh, and what I think was really funny is this vision of what you're trying to inspire has to be directed in the right place. The problem for most of us as leaders is we fall into the same trap that salespeople fall into. And that is this. We spray and pray. We show up and throw up. What we do is we tell people about all the features of everything that we're doing but we don't talk about the benefit to each person. Frank Lutz talked about that this morning in the opening, in his session this morning, right? People care about what it means to them. What's in it for me? When people understand the value of something to them, that's when they start to truly appreciate it. If we just tell people what something is, they don't. Like, let's take this, a new car. Anybody in the market, anyone's been trying to buy a new car lately? Some of you, right? That, 
they'll talk about features all day long. Oh, it's got this, it's got this, it's got that. You talk about the electronics that are in cars now, it's amazing. Right? You get all sorts of different features. From a radio all the way down, right, you can have a, uh, the HD radio, a DVD player in there. You can have a wireless internet connection. Here's the percentage of people who think those things are valuable. AM, FM radio, in the era of today's technology, is the number one most requested feature in a car. Why? Because people know its value to them. What we do is we say things like, oh, your car can become its own hotspot. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, that, I guess that's cool, right? How, why is it so low? Because nobody knows what the hell that means. They don't understand how it values them. What great leaders do is they don't just give you a feature to something. They don't just tell you, hey, this is a great plan. Oh, here's my idea for what we can do to lead us forward. Here's how it matters to you. What leaders do is they answer a very simple question. So what? If when you get done talking to someone, they can still ask this question. So what? You're focusing on features, not on benefits. Great leaders know that people buy things that have value to them. In essence, people make decisions every day for one of two reasons. One, because it will make their life better. Or two, because it will make their life less painful. Or, as Rob Bass once put it, joy and pain, sunshine and rain. Um, not enough Rob Bass fans here. Okay, we'll just keep moving on, all right? You've got to focus as a leader not on the features of what you're trying to sell in your ideas, but the benefits of your vision. When you sell the benefits of your vision, people understand the value to themselves. Okay, that's step one. Step two, what I need to do is you need to be authentic. Authentic to yourself and authentic to who you are. So do me a favor, this is now where I need everyone to make sure you have your white sheet of paper in front of you your magical white sheet of paper. If you did not get one, Tim's got some more there. You're gonna wanna get this piece of paper out and you wanna make sure that it doesn't have anything you want to keep on it because you will not be getting it back. So if you've been taking some copious notes, you're gonna wanna make sure that you get some out. But what I want you to do, once you get that piece of paper, I want you to draw a big circle on it. All right, draw a big circle on that sheet of paper. All right, draw a big circle on that sheet of paper. <laughs> it's tough up here because you really can see nothing, all right? All right, we'll get that going. But draw a big circle. And then what I need you to do, once you've drawn a big circle, I want you to look around at everybody in the room, including people who are hanging out in the doorway. Look around at everybody in here. Because what you're going to do next is you're going to rank yourself in one of three categories. All right? How good do you think you are as a leader compared to the other people in this room? Okay? If you think you're in the top 25% of leaders in this room, okay, like maybe you're not the best, but you're pretty darn good, okay? You're gonna take that circle, you're gonna turn it into a smiley face. If you look around this room and you go, I'm not the best, but I'm certainly not the worst, you're gonna make a flatline face if you're in that middle 50%. If you look around this room and you go, what are we doing? <laughs> you're probably in the bottom 25%, <laughs> all right? and you're gonna make a frowny face. So again, you're just comparing yourself with the other people in this room. Okay, just the other people in this room. If you think you're in the top 25%, you're gonna make a smiley face. If you think you're in the middle 50, you're gonna draw a flat line face. If you think you're in the top, I mean in the bottom 25, you're gonna draw a, a frowny face. When you're done, fold your piece of paper in half so no one else can see it, and then hold it up for me so that I know you are done. All right, getting pretty close here. Getting pretty close, just about everybody's done. Okay, what I'm gonna ask you to do next, two things. Number one, I'm gonna ask you to take your piece of paper and trade it with someone at another table. And number two, I want you to resist the urge to immediately open up the piece of paper and look at it, okay? So you're gonna swap with someone at a different table. This may require you to get up. Next, you are gonna take that piece of paper and swap it with a different person at a different table. Then you're going to swap the piece of paper a third time with a third person at a third different table. Nice. 
the year I ran it was so hot. I was I was dying. That's nice, but yeah, not too bad. How was it for you? Good. Yeah. It was your first first time. Oh, it's an yeah, unbelievable experience. I mean, the crowds the whole way. I mean, it's it is it's awesome. All right. Once you have traded your piece of paper three times, I'd like you to do now trade your piece of paper with somebody at your table. Okay. Now, if all has gone well, okay, we have randomized the room which means you have someone else's piece of paper in front of you, a complete stranger's. It destroys the whole purpose of randomization if by some dumb stroke of luck you got your paper back <laughs> and you shout out to everybody, hey, I got mine back. Then they know it's not random. All right. So um, I'm looking around the room. I'm going to guess that we have about, let's call it 160 people here. More? <laughs> Depends. Is this campaign rally? We've got at least 300 here. We've got at least <laughs> 300, maybe more. I can't tell out in the hallway. <laughs> Sorry. I only kid because I didn't get elected, all right? Because we really did only have three people at my rallies. That's why. All right. So uh, <laughs> let's call it 200 just for giggles, OK? But it has to be a number that makes easy math. So if there's 200 people, that means that 50 of you are in the top quartile, right? A small amount. So let's do this. Open up your piece of paper for me. And if your piece of paper has a smiley face on it, please raise your hand. <laughs> really? <sighs> Okay, put your hands down. For those of you watching at home, just so you know, that's half the room that just put up their hands that think they are in the top. This is the same group that not one of you voted yourself to be leader at the beginning of this workshop. <laughs> it's like, like yes, uh, one, uh, one tip on being a better leader, and I'm already in the top 25%. <laughs> wow. So many of us think that highly of ourselves. All right, let's try this. If your piece of paper has a frowny face, not a flat line, but has a frowny face on it, again, there should be 50 of you, raise your hand. Seven, eight, nine, ten. So about 20. So half of, over half of us think we're in the top 25%, and about 10% of us think we're in the bottom 25%. Why? We don't know, because we don't get authentic feedback, all right? Because let's be honest, we don't like real feedback oftentimes. So when somebody gives us something that's a little constructive, what's our natural response? Pushback, right? How do you know? Try doing my job for once and you wouldn't say the same thing, right? <laughs> so one of the highlights of my early career, I got invited to speak and uh, was Truly one of my most amazing experiences. I got to speak at the NRA show. That's restaurants, not rifles, just so you know. Okay, the other NRA. All right. I spoke in front of a big group. It was a life, it was a dream of mine. I got the chance to do this workshop. It was awesome. I loved it. I'm reading the feedback afterward, right? Because you fill out evaluations about speakers and, and they're all like, oh, it's great, it was awesome. And then this I got to this one comment and um oh, hold on. Yeah, yeah, I'm oh, sorry, well then okay. This is a comment he wrote for me, or she. In my mind, it's a he. <laughs> Dang, right? <laughs> All right, so. A couple of things go through my mind as I'm reading this. All right, number one, man, he's angry, all right? Two, who takes that much time? <laughs> We're not even like just typing some, something on Twitter here, right? He hand wrote this following the session. My response, of course, after reading this was? So what? And what do you know, <laughs> right? Try doing, try drinking up there doing that, right? I'm, just pushed back. I got angry. I got defensive. And then I said to myself, <laughs> That was 
actually the third thought. That was, I was going to let you know. That's, uh, you're jumping ahead in the program. I, I was like, maybe it's true. Maybe I don't want to hear this because it's real. And so what I did is I made a point from there on out to focus what I do in more research methodology and to find real neuroscience behind what we do and find real proven truth about what I talk about. I typed that up and in my office and in my office for every day for the last 15 years that stares me in the face at my cube wherever I am as a reminder that that's a real criticism and that I can be better. But we have to get away from this defensiveness. And the challenge is, it comes at us from all sides. So here's what I would recommend. I'm a big proponent of stealing shamelessly from people who have great ideas. One of the organizations I think has a great idea on this is the US Army. US Army, if you get sent into battle, every single soldier has a battle buddy. That battle buddy has one responsibility, to get you home alive. That's going to mean he's going to have to tell you some things. She's going to have to do some things that you don't want to do because you know it's your best interest and heart you're going to follow. I think everyone needs a battle buddy. I need you to find somebody that you can trust who will be authentic with you and give you real feedback. Because it's so easy with so much negativity coming at us all the time to assume that everyone is just out to get us. But in reality, what great leaders do, they practice authenticity. They find ways to get more real because they have someone they trust who will give them real feedback. Find that person in your life. Or if you already do, confirm that that's what you want. Because in the immortal words of American poet, hopefully more of you remember this American poet, Ice Cube. <laughs> You'd better checkity check yourself before you wreckity wreck yourself. All right? OK, let's move on. All right, secret number three, um, as we talk about this, it revolves a little bit more work. So everyone, take out your white sheet of paper that you know has a smiley face on it. Who am I kidding, OK? And what you're going to do on the back side of that is you're going to make six big blocks, just like this. So six big blocks. You want to fill up the whole page with those six blocks. OK. Now what we're going to do in this exercise, we're going to start right here. This is going to be box number one. And then we're going to go to box number two, three, four, five, and six. So we're going to start here, then here, then here, then here, then here. Okay. So that's the order you're going to fill out. I'm going to show you a screen, uh, what's up on the screen, that I want you to put in the box. Okay. There will be three things that I will show you on the screen. There will be a word. You will write the word. Below that, you're going to write the color that the box actually is. And the third thing, there will be a number there. You're going to write then the number after that. So let's start with box number one. So in box number one, you would write the word, which is red. You'd write the color, which is also red. And then you'd write the number, which is seven. Before some of you, because I, kn I know who you are in this room, you can either write out the word seven or just write the number seven. If you want to write it in Roman numerals, you can do that as well, OK? <laughs> Your choice, all right? But you would in this box in that upper right hand corner, upper left hand corner, write red, red, seven. Okay? Yes, you can do that now. All right, so again, we're starting in this upper left hand box right here. That's where you're gonna write red, red, seven. The next box I'm gonna show you will be this one. The next box I'll show you will be that one. Then we'll go up here, up here, and we'll end down here. Okay? So again, that's in box number one is red, red, seven. So let's then go to box number two. Three, four, five, six, and time. All right. By the way, my quote of the day right now is, oh, hey, huh? <laughs> I don't know if anyone else got to hear that. I did. All right. So how many of you think you got 100%? My super smart table in the back here, they're like, yes, I've got the perfect angle. The rest of you, anybody quit after box three because it was too fast? Some of you are like, I'm done. Right? I have a stupid exercise. I don't want to do it anymore, right? So what made it, I got the last one, yeah, because I was there for like 10 seconds, OK? What made this exercise hard? Speed. What else? Surprise. Surprise. What do you mean by surprise? 
I was in, you were in one mindset, all of a sudden that mindset had to shift, right? Like, oh, I thought we we're gonna have plenty of time, now you're being a jerk of me. Okay, good, all right, game on, right? What else? The amount of information we had to report, right? There was three things, it was a lot of stuff. What else? I was saying one thing, so it was box one, box two, and the numbers didn't match to what was on the screen. She's getting some serious back injury over here, right? What else made it hard? I'm Now who's the ass, right? Anything else make it hard? The words don't match the colors sometimes. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So again, this pattern is off. All right. The number, which is at the front, is the last thing you write. In essence, what I'm asking your brain to do in this exercise is to multitask, to switch around and do a lot of different things at the same time, right? to juggle those balls. How many of you are good multitaskers, would you say? Many of you are good multitaskers? Yeah. Um, what the studies will show you is that people who say they're good multitaskers actually score less well at multitasking than those of you who don't. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, it's not me, it's the research, okay? But here's what's also important to know about multitasking, is that we think multitasking is like a bunch of balls in the air and we're doing a lot of things at the same time. The problem with the human brain is the human brain doesn't juggle. The human brain operates on a single track at a time. So if we want to juggle and we want to move ball from here to here, we actually have to move to a different track. And what happens is every time you move from one activity to the next mental activity, your brain slows down. And then you move back and it slows down again. And you move back and it slows down again. What that same research will show you is they found when people were multitasking, their IQ dropped on average by 12 points. You're doing more things at once, but you're doing them worse. The human brain works best when we get to do one thing at a time, or what I like to say, monotask. Here's the, uh, what we had. Red, red, seven. Green, red, three. Blue, blue, five. Red, green, two. Black, blue, six. Blue, gray, three. Why did I show that? Because some of you are super competitive, and if I didn't, you would kill me, okay? <laughs> Some of you are like, yes, I got it. All right, I, lo I love how competitive people are. Right? There's no prize, there's no nothing. There wasn't even a mention of that, but some of you right now are like, yeah, I'm that good. All right. The lesson is this. You may have gotten lucky, but the brain doesn't do multiple things well. We operate best when we monotask. The challenge is this. We are constantly pressured and feel oftentimes the tyranny to do multiple things at the same time. People tell us we have to do this, you gotta do this, you gotta be in this meeting, you gotta do this, you gotta do this call, right? I love people when they're on a conference call and they're very obviously not muted and they're typing away at the same time, right? Have you ever played the game where you try and ask people different questions to figure out who it is that's typing on the conference call? Because you can tell, right? All of a sudden it stops and like, what? <laughs> oh no, I was here the whole time, right? <laughs> the reality is, that's when you mess up, when you're doing multiple things. Your IQ makes you stupider. Let's put this in a way that five states in the United States understand better than anyone else, okay? If you want to drop your IQ by six points, smoke weed, okay? If you don't, it drops by 12 by multitasking. You get twice as stupid multitasking as you do if you are high. <laughs> Let that sink in. And the good news is, it's legal in all 50 states. Bad news is, zero tax revenue for multitasking, okay? So I'm just I'm gonna let you know that right now. All right, so let's move on. We're gonna do a little word association. I'm gonna put a word up on the screen. I need you all to shout out the opposite. So if the word is up, the opposite is? Yeah. All right, if the word is good, the opposite is? Yeah. If the word is success, the opposite is? Yeah. Awesome, but that's totally wrong. All right, yeah, it really is. Why, we've been triggered to believe that failure is the opposite of success. What great legendary leaders have proven to us time and time again is that failure is often a stepping stone and a precursor to success. But you have to learn from those failures. The challenge for a lot of us leaders is two things. Number one, failure oftentimes feels like we are losing so much face that we will never get it back. Second of all, we refuse sometimes to allow a failure of a larger project to doom us and our brand.
And so we end up avoiding things that may cause any opportunity for failure. The reality is great things happen when people fail. Anybody out there dog people? Any dog people? Nice. All right, dog people, they're good. All right. So dogs are awesome. There was this guy in Scandinavia in the 1920s, had this dog, he had a whole bu bunch of them. He would send them out in the yard in the spring, and they loved to run out and run and play. But the problem is, at night when the dogs came home, they were covered with burrs. If you don't have dogs and you've never tried to take burrs out of dogs, don't. <laughs> it is like torture. It is really, really awful. So he realized this and he said, ah, I can either keep my dogs inside all day or try something different. So he went outside and he cut down all the bushes all over his property that had any sort of thing that got these kind of thistles on them, this, uh, any, any one of that stuff. He sent his dogs out. And that night they came home and they were covered in burrs. That's right. He's like, okay, this is a problem. But I'm not going to let these stupid burrs beat me. He had a genius idea to learn from his failure. And so he shaved his dogs <laughs> and sent them out. And that night when the dogs came in, they were still covered with burrs. And he's like, how is it possible they don't have any fur? And so what he did is he started to look closer at the burr, and he realized he thought the burrs had these points on them, but reality was that they were hooks. And what's happening is they were hooking into the hoops of skin, which is why it hurt so bad when they were pulling him out, and why cutting the hair off didn't do anything. And he's like, wow, that is amazing. How do you get something to stick that well and hold that well? There's no glue, there's no nothing. So he said, what would happen if we tried to replicate this? Some new synthetic fabric had been coming out, allowed you to create shapes. So he created a piece of paper that had a bunch of little plastic hooks on it, created another one that had a little bunch of plastic hoops on it, put them together, and from there was the invention of Velcro. Never before had someone thought about taking the power of nature to create our own non-glue-based adhesive. Great things happen when failure presents itself. How many folks do I have from the great state of New York? Yeah. Woo! All right, I love the story because it combines New York with culinary, which is my background, all right? Potato chips, how do potato chips get created? An angry chef, right? Up in Saratoga Springs, a guy orders sliced baked potatoes. Chef brings it out, guy starts eating it. These are too mushy, sends them back to the chef. Quick note again from a former culinary trainer, don't send food back to the chef. <laughs> Just suck it up, okay, maybe, okay. But the problem was, the cook then put them back in the oven, baked them really hard, put them back out, and gave them to the guy again. The guy cut into them, still too mushy. Again, word for the wise, never send food back a second time. The chef now is livid. Goes out, gets a big thing of boiling oil, puts the baked uh, scraps in there, throws them into the pot of boiling oil, till literally there is nothing left. They are burnt to a crisp puts them back on the plate, personally delivers them to the guy. What do you think of these? These too mushy for you? Guy bites into them and goes, I love these, these are great. And potato chips were born. Failure and anger sometimes can be redirected to good things. Other great companies like 3M, all right, 3M designs lots of products, spends millions of dollars in R&D. One of their most famous products is called picture glue. Picture glue was designed because people got tired of hanging photos and pictures on the wall where they couldn't find studs and they kept falling. So they put this glue, they made it, I don't know if you've ever purchased it, but you put it on the back of paintings and you stick it to a wall and then when you're ready you can remove it from the wall. It was a fantastic technology. It was awesome with one minor flaw. After 24 hours, pic the pictures got too heavy and fell off the wall. So they tried doing different variations of the glue, they tried this several different times, couldn't get anything to work, scrapped the project over, after over $2 million in development. Another engineer at a different program, about a year later, uh, was at church and was, he was a klutz, he was an engineer, it happens, uh, kept tripping up the stairs and would knock the, uh, all the, bull, the uh, bookmarks out of his hymnal. Well, he's like, oh, this is a pain. So he went back to his friend who did the picture glue, said, hey, can I borrow some of that? Put some picture glue on the back of his bookmarks, put his bookmarks back in, and what he found is he could pull the bookmarks in and out, and when he tripped, they didn't fall. He's like, this was pretty cool. And as a result, they said, maybe we could do something more with this and created the best-selling office product of all time, Post-it Notes. The failed picture glue has been repurposed as Post-it Notes. 
How many in this room have an iPad? Anybody have an iPad? Ooh, just about everybody. Anybody have a first generation iPad? You remember the first generation iPad, right? The memo pad? You, know, you didn't have that? 1987, Apple took it off the market, only 500 of them ever sold. But if you look at it, it's got everything an iPad has today. Right? It's got icons, it's got apps, it's got even a little uh, a stencil you could write on it. Here's the problem. Consumers weren't ready for it. It was a great idea ahead of its time. When Apple was ready and realized that consumers were ready, the new iPad was launched. Sometimes failure comes because you don't do something well. Sometimes failure comes because people aren't ready. When you learn from your failures, that's when great success happens. The greatest fear comes oftentimes in failing to even take that step rather than to come up maybe a little bit short and learn from it. Most of us are so scared to be seen as failures that we don't even try. Don't let that happen. Next, we need to change our perspective sometimes. Um, anybody in here see the movie Jaws? Anybody you seen Jaws? Just a quick reminder, we're going to need a bigger boat, right? Uh, anybody don't go in the ocean anymore as a result of seeing Jaws? Anyone <laughs> give up the ocean? Like, I mean, I'll go in up to about here, OK? That's about it, all right? That is it. I am scared to death of sharks, right? Anybody love sharks? Shark Week's a big hit, so I know somebody out there has to love these things, OK? Awful. Um, generally speaking, anybody here sh scared of sharks? Who's scared of sharks? OK, good. All right, that's important. Now, there's another thing that also we talk a lot about, and that's selfie sticks. Anybody here scared of selfie sticks? <laughs> like four of you, right? So I think you're going to know the answer to this question. But what do you suppose in 2015 killed more people? <laughs> Sharks or selfie sticks? What do you think? By a two to one margin, more people died from selfie sticks than they did from shark attacks. And yet, there's not a single person that's like, I'm not going to that theme park unless there's no more selfie sticks. All right? Sometimes we have to change our perspective about what reality is. All right? And then there's other times we run into problems because some things don't always have a clear cut answer. All right? So, how many slats of wood are in this picture? <laughs> okay, it's one picture. How many are there? Four? four? Seven. <laughs> Seven? <laughs> You're like, three, four, three, four. How can that be? There's one picture. How do we have multiple answers? Surely there's a right and a wrong answer. That's the world we live in, isn't it? It's binary. Yes and no. Good and bad. Up and down. Right and left. But the reality is, Sometimes it works best to realize that there's not one answer and to start asking around for other people's perception of things, right? How often in this world do those of us even unknowingly say things like, how could she think that? What were you thinking when you did that? Why would you choose that? Why would you vote that? I don't even get it. Until we start looking at different people's perspective and figuring things out, we'll never understand why. Odds are, People make a decision for a logical reason. But emotionally, sometimes we refuse to admit that. Great legendary leaders put that ego aside. They put that emotion aside and ask people, why? And when you get that different perspective, you begin to realize that there's not always concrete, easy answers. Because that's not the way that life works. OK. Um, moment of truth time, confessional time. How many of you have checked your phones during the session? I just looked over to dude just checking his phone. I'm sorry, you're so busted. All right, how many of you have looked at your phones during this session? Was, was it not good enough? Did I not have enough content? Were there not enough dancing girls? What was it? All right, the challenge is this. For most of us, we're constantly checking our phones, right? Why? Because that's how we communicate with people. What I'm going to tell you is we have to start trading screens for faces. We have to stop using technology as our sole means of communication. Now, I understand why we do it, right? especially from a constituent outreach perspective. Right? When you look at this, social media, 
In 2005, less than 10% of all of our constituents were on social media. Today, two thirds and three quarters are. All right? It's like, why do you rob the banks? Because that's where the money is. Why do we use social media to do outreach to constituents? Because that's where they are. I don't need to talk to people, I'll just put up a Facebook page. We'll just tweet this out to everyone. It's convenient, it's easy, but it's not always effective. Here's the challenge. Um, in the 1970s, some of you were working in the 1970s, you know this, the average person received about 1,000 pieces of electronic communication per year. Right, most of that came in the form of a brand new technology called the facsimile machine. All right, you had that little scrolled paper, right? You had to tear it off. Nice, right? Then in the 1980s, we got voicemail. All of a sudden, we could now leave messages for anyone, anytime. The number of messages most people got was about 4,000. But then things got cray cray. In the 1990s, we got email, right? And email was amazing. There's only one problem with email in the 90s for you young kids in the room. Dial up, right? <laughs> and those of you know who were traveling around the country at the time, this was the hilarious part that people love to forget about. If you had AOL, you had a book. And whenever you would go to some random town, it would tell you the numbers to call to get AOL in that town. That's not creepy, right? And yet we did it without thinking. Then in the 2000s, though, things got better. We got Broadband, we got wireless. Now, what do you suppose happened to the number of communications we got in the 2000s? It went from 9,000 to 25,000. Now in the 21st century, the 2010s, we have voicemail, we've got email, we've got fax, we've got SMS, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got more than 30,000 messages annually. As a result, can we get through all 30,000 emails? No. So what do we do? We play bad office Tinder, right? No, 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 yes, no, no. I... <laughs> you all have emails, you know this. There are people you get an email from and you delete it before you read it because you know who it's from, right? Other times you just read the subject line, right? And then people are like, didn't you read my email? I'm like, I mean, the subject, right? I assumed I knew what the rest of it said. Right? Here's the biggest challenge. When you look at how we communicate, and you break down the percentages, 7% uh, of what we communicate is through the actual words that we use. The other 93% in terms of communication is from our body language, our tone, our inflection. When we use electronic communication, we leave 97% of the interpretation of that message to someone else. We may communicate a lot, but we're not saying anything. They get to interpret the message. Find ways to trade screens for faces. Get face to face with people. Communicate with them. Don't let them simply take the easy way out because it's so simple to do. Legendary leaders find ways to connect on a human, on a personal level, and that creates a difference. Final strategy is to think big about what we do. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a final uh, video I want to show you here uh, to kind of help point this out. So here's what we do. In this video, we're going to watch two teams. One team is wearing white t-shirts, one team is wearing black t-shirts. What you're going to do is you're going to count and keep track of the number of times the team in white passes the basketball to itself. Okay? It's a team of white players, a team of uh, players in white t-shirts, and a team of players in black t-shirts. You're only going to watch the ones in white t-shirts pass the ball to each other. It could be an air pass, it could be a bounce pass. You may want to just keep little tick marks, okay? Just to, so you know, it will put the instructions up again. But what you're going to do is watch and count the number of times the team in white bounces the basketball or passes the basketball to itself. Just the team in white. All right, how many, how many have you got at least 14? 15? How many guess 16? Correct answer is 15! Woo! That's not the important question. The important question is, did you see the gorilla? 
All right, let's rewind the video. Are you kidding me? I remember the first time I watched this video, they're like, did you see the gorilla? I'm still high-fiving everyone because I got 15. I'm like, yeah, I'm the smartest, woo! Like, did you see the gorilla? I'm like, what? All right. And I saw that video, I'm like, what, did it just like pop its head in from the side or something? No. It walked in the middle and banged its chest. I'm like, that's a different video. <laughs> so why don't we oftentimes see the gorilla? We're focused on what's in front of us. We get so sucked into the little details. We're so focused on inconsequential minutia that we forget the whole big picture of why we're leading people in the first place. It's so easy to get drawn into the unimportant that we forget what's big and what's really important. All right? Focus on benefits. Let people know, so what? Find ways to get real. Find your battle buddy who will give you authentic feedback so that you can help get real change. Tr don't try and do two multiple things at the same time. Don't let failure separate you from potential success. Change your perspective about where you see things from. Trade those screens for faces and stay above it all. What I'd like you to do right now for me, in closing, can I get everyone to stand up as you're able? All right. And here's what I want you to do. I need everyone to put your arms out in front of you. Everyone, if you could, try and face this, uh, the front here, okay? Put your two hands together, put a little pointer finger out in front of you, all right? And here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Keeping your feet in a firm place, just right here. What I'm gonna ask you to do is we're gonna, when I say go, we're all gonna turn to the left. So just remember which way is left, okay? <laughs> All right. So when I say go, what I want you to do is keeping your feet firmly in place, you're going to take your arms, keep them straight, and you're going to twist your torso to the left as far as you can go, and you're going to go find a spot in a wall or the back of someone's head or something, but you're going to go as far as you can go, and then we'll come back, okay? So feet firmly on the ground, arms straight, feet firmly planted. When I say go, we're going to go to the left as far as we can go. All right, here we go. On your mark, get set, go to the left as far as you can go and come back. All right, woo. All right, shake it out for me real quick. Hopefully no one has injured themselves. <laughs> Hopefully. All right, now here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Keep your feet firmly in place, your arms in front of you, just like this. Do you remember where you went last time? Yes. yes. Here's what I ask you to do. We're gonna go, when I say go this time, we're gonna keep going to the left, just like we did, but I want you to go an inch further than you did last time, okay? So you can go about an inch further than we went last time. All right, here we go. On your mark, get set, go. Let's see if we can twist and go about an inch further uh, and back. All right, how many of you were able to go further the second time than the first time? Holy crap, just about everybody. All right, obviously you were not listening to my instructions. How far did I tell you to go the first time? As far as you could go. And yet the second time, you were able to go still further. When you think you've hit your leadership journey and you've gotten as far as you can go and you've reached the best pinnacle of leadership, remember, you can do a little more and be legendary. All right? Thank you all for your time. Thank you for your work. Um, again, if you want to get a copy of the Prezi, just uh, leave your business card or email address. We'll have a little pile up here um, on the front. And I will also have my business card too.